The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Jesus, should we forgive up to seven times? Peter asks, trying to be overly generous and look good. I begin with a story. Because, as you know, stories are what you take home and lodge in your heart and you remember them. So a few years ago, in my third call, in International Falls, you never heard of it, Minnesota. <laughs> Very cold. Um, warmer here, I love it. On a warm afternoon, it was otherwise quiet, my secretary wasn't in, I heard the unmistakable sound of an obnoxious, large pickup without a muffler. <laughs> if I were to write a book, 10 Things I Hate, a pickup without a muffler is one of them. And it isn't very nice. Maybe he didn't have the money, but I wonder. Uh, it turned out to be a he in his mid-40s. He roared into the parking lot, slammed his door, and I could hear him trouncing up the 12 steps to the landing where my office was. I knew there was trouble. Uh, my door was open just a little bit. He uh, burst in, and he was huge. I mean, I'm not a big guy, so most guys are bigger. This guy was like a football player. And angry as heck. I didn't even get a chance to stand up, and he came right across in front of the desk and started doing that, <clears throat> that distance finger pointing that guys do, like this, you know. And he said, are you the pastor that's going to do my dad's funeral? <laughs> now I knew a little bit about who he might be because there was a funeral being planned for a man who had cancer. And I had visited him. I brought anointing oils and the Eucharist a couple of times. And I had talked with his wife. They'd been married over 55 years. Marvelous couple. And she had come to terms with his death. She loved him dearly. And he was so hurting physically, she asked me to pray for his death. A very faithful thing. Anyway, uh, she did tell me she had two sons that didn't get along. And so now I figured this was one of them. 
uh, and he, I was intimidated. I'll, I'll be very honest. He said, I got a couple things to tell you. And he said, and you want to know why? And I thought, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. Uh, right now, I'm just sort of trembling here. And he was like right in my face. And he said, because I got a brat of a brother, and I'll leave out all the expletives. He said, he's the biggest jerk in the world, the little brat. And I hate him. He got everything when we were growing up. This was hockey area. The best hockey stick, the one everybody wanted, he got. But I never got one. I got a used one because I was the first kid. And then he got the best skates, and he went right down the list. This litany, this sad litany of all the reasons why his brother was such a jerk and why he hated him. And he said, on the off chance that he might be at the funeral, I ain't showing up. I will not be in the same room with him. In fact, Pastor, I haven't seen him for over 10 years, and that's the way it's going to be. Now, that's a little extreme. <laughs> I've had a lot of pastoral conversations over the years, but this was, and I started to ask him a question. He said, you aren't my family, and you're not my pastor. He said, I suppose you called my brother already, and you got all his side on your side. And, I, and at this point, I was a little ticked. And I stood up and I said, no, I haven't talked to your brother, but I have something to tell you. And I, for a moment, he was disarmed because he didn't expect this guy. <laughs> it was quiet, and I said, number one, I happen to know something about you. And he started talking. I said, just a minute, I'm not done. You and your brother were baptized into Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world many years ago, in this congregation. And when you were baptized, you know what? You got a new life, and you can't get out of it. He didn't like that. <laughs> I said, the Holy Spirit has been working in your life with grace, forgiveness, love, compassion, reconciliation. And he was like going crazy with all these words. Like, he said, no, and I said, be quiet. I said, you were confirmed in this faith. And... You have a father that's dying. It's time for you to use that compassion. I honestly didn't rehearse this. It just kind of came out. Uh, I don't know if it was the spirit, however it was, but I was, this little guy, I'm now pointing to him, see? And he went right up in my face, gave me the finger, and charged out. Started up that loud, that loud pickup and left. And I'm standing there thinking, what just happened? <laughs> a week later, his brother calls. Same sad litany, only just reverse, you know. Uh, and he said, I'm not coming to the funeral on the chance that that jerk of my brother's going to be there. You got that? And I gave him the same thing. I said, you know, you were baptized into Christ. He hung up. Okay. Uh, the funeral was coming up soon. I mean, he had gone into hospice at this point. We knew it was soon. His mother took me aside when I was in their house and said, uh, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not sad my husband's dying, but I cry every single night because I've lost my sons. They're not Christian. They hate each other. And she said, I'm afraid they're not going to be at the funeral. And typical pastoral, we love to be helpful. Oh, Gladys, not her name. Uh, your, your sons will come in the very end. It's their dad's funeral. She said, you don't know them. And I thought, actually, I do. <laughs> They're not going to be here. All right. Uh, found out from her, it was not just a 10-year emotional cutoff. It was a 12-year. And they had, in fact, not seen each other except once by accident at a bar. And they immediately both left. Uh, they didn't talk to each other on the phone. They uh, did this thing called triangling. And they called their mother. And they talked through their mother. They didn't talk to their dad. And they found out where the other one was. And they made sure they never were at any family reunions. Any time that other brother was there, their hatred was so deep. Now, I wonder if you know if they ever came to the funeral. I wish I could tell you right now, but I can't. I'll save that for the end. <laughs> a little cliffhanger, see? That's a little pastor's trick. I've been around the block. <laughs> All right. 
we have this incredible story in Genesis chapter 50 of this outrageous forgiveness that Joseph, who had been treated so rottenly by his brothers, at the very end forgives them unconditionally. And by the way, forgives them not just by thinking about it or saying it, but by taking care of them. Have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones, it says at the end of our text. That's forgiveness. You know, it's not just thinking it. It's doing something about it. Uh, Our psalm today reminds us, bless the Lord who forgives all your sins. This is what God is like. A forgiving God. See, powerful God with forgiveness. Though we're not puppets, so he doesn't make us do it, but God is working through the Holy Spirit. She never takes a break. She's always creating the life of Christ inside of us, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not. It's always happening. It's happening in you right now. That's the way the gospel works. It's all God doing all this work, and we're along for the ride. And we can stop it if we want, and we can pout. And when we're done pouting, God will say, all right, little kid, come back. I love you dearly. Pout fest is over. Get to work with the life of Christ in you, see? Uh, I love the Romans text where St. Paul says, the most un-American thing you could say, we do not live to ourselves. (laughs) And we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. Not this president, this country, these politicians, none of that, see? We live to the Lord. If you die, to die to the Lord. Uh, The wife of the husband knew that well, very well. She's a model for all of us. Um, And then we have Peter. (laughs) Wonderful Peter who, you know, he's so honest and so blunt. Um, Should I forgive up to seven times? He'd been in seminary with Jesus for three years, you know. (laughs) He had heard this stuff, but, yeah, up to seven. And Jesus says 77 times. Or in the other variant, manuscript, it says 70 times seven, 490 times, which is outrageous. It simply means you keep forgiving, see? Uh, This Jesus was part of Middle Eastern culture, and in Middle Eastern culture, there's all kinds of haggling and exaggeration. That's just the way it is. And I'm telling you this because when it comes to parables, we have to understand they're not literal. There may be literal parts to them, but they're not literal. They're metaphoric. They're beyond literal. Beyond literal. They're so important. Uh, And Jesus exaggerates at the end of his parable, which is troublesome for Christians, by the way. I know you've already had a little eye twitch when he said, so will my heavenly father do to you. Just remember, he's an itinerant Mediterranean preacher. They love exaggeration. (laughs) All right. uh, So, we have this parable, and what is it? A king? A king who uh, dismisses an outrageous debt. By the way, 10,000 talents. I think you talk about exaggeration. It would take 164,000 years to repay that. And a denarius, a denarii, uh, was one day's wage. So the second slave only owes 100 denarii. That's a third of a year to pay off versus 164,000 years. See, parables are windows, icons, openings to deep spiritual truth if we're open to them. And have fun with them. I mean, it's hilarious, these extremes, see? But they're meant to get your attention. Uh, That's just the way Mediterranean culture is. Incidentally, just for free, I was in Cairo, Egypt in, I think, 1999, trying to be very romantic with my wife. I married up. And uh, she's here today, Becky over here. And uh, so I was going to get this dress. Not a good idea uh, on my part, but I I was feeling very lovey. And I went to the Calicalaya Street in Cairo, They warned me, Tom, you're going to haggle. You're going to haggle. You're not going to start out with the price that uh, you think you are. You'll get there, but it's all a big game, but it's this Mediterranean culture, see? And so I started, he he said, 
<laughs> actually it was Bishop Hansen at the time, he said, start low, Tom, because they're going to start high. Sure enough, I saw the dress, and, uh, I, and I got it out. I was going to be so smart. Got it out real early. Well, I'll give you such and such. He goes, oh, 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 you're killing me. I mean, all this dramatic. And he asked for this much, and I went here, and he went there, and sure enough, we got exactly where we wanted. But you've got to play the game, see? It's all this exaggeration. All right. Uh, it's a parable. And it's rich with materials. The Holy Spirit has sought to keep all the stuff in the Bible in for us as a depository, and we get to work with it and have fun with it and be challenged by it and find joy in it. But you don't have to force yourself to think that Jesus here is talking about a, a God who has created a literal fiery hell, like my good friend, well-meaning when I was a kid, Jimmy, who went to a fundamentalist church, and he said, you're a Lutheran, Tom. I said, yes. He said, well, that means you're going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really believe the Bible. And I said, what? what? And uh, no, there's, well, we can lay at the feet this fundamentalist thinking uh, for part of the reason that 70 million Americans never go to church. As if this is what God, God loves you so much that he would put you in a hell if you made some mistakes for eternity. Oh, and then Jimmy was... And you know it's fire. And you, you imagine, have you burnt your finger before, Tom? And imagine your whole body burning for eternity. No, you don't have to force yourself to think like that, see? We think as we look at the parables in a Mediterranean style. All right. For my money, at the very end, and I'll be honest about it, no, this is me, uh, when the talk of the jailers or the torturers that can be interchanged in Matthew uh, that business about torture, I take to mean the tortured conscience. Because think about these two sons, right? For 12 years, where were they living? In hell. One woman said to me on the plane, I was going to Russia, I had my bling on. She said, you're a religious person. I said, yes. She said, do you believe in hell? <laughs> and I said, yes. She said, and it's hot there, it's burning. I said, no. I said, we create our own hells. God doesn't need to create it. We do fine on our own, see? I take this ending here, which is troublesome. So will my heavenly Father do to you if you don't forgive someone from the heart. I'll hand you over to the torturers. Well, I take that to mean the tortured conscience that we naturally get when we don't forgive, see? Now, that's, uh, that's just for free. It may, uh, you, there are... Parables open up a variety, a plethora of meanings. They don't close off meanings. Okay, well, did the brothers come to the funeral? 10 o'clock on a Friday, we had the visitation. You know how that goes. You have a funeral in the Lutheran church. Almost all of us, we have an hour of visitation, which is gold, by the way. People need that. And I thought, well, they'll show up at 10. I mean, they're angry and they're, you know, odd, but they'll show up. No, 10 o'clock, no brothers. Mom was being consoled by all kinds of people who showed up. And I overheard them saying, yeah, it's, it's okay, you'll see your husband again. And finally she snapped, I'm not worried about my husband. He's in good hands. God bless it that he's gone and with the, with the Father and the saints in light and so on. She said, I'm worried about my sons. Oh, they'll come. They were just like me. They'll be here. The funeral's not till 11. 11 o'clock came up. No sons. Mom was weeping through the entire funeral liturgy. No sons the entire time. We got in the hearse, went out to the little country graveyard. I can still see it up there in Ericsburg cut out of the forest and the, the, the lakes and the streams and as we were driving up to the gate the funeral director says uh oh I said what he said see those two pickups over there <laughs> nose to nose right next to the hole with a uh, large thermos remember those thermoses that had 58 gallons of coffee in them and they pumped down like that and you could go to a game and drink coffee all night that was sitting on the top, and they were drinking coffee and shouting. And he said, I'm glad you're the pastor. I've known those kids since they were like this. There's trouble here. And as soon as he said that, the bigger one, he gave me the finger, 
comes running to the hearse. I was barely out with my, you know, my uh, alb and my stole and my prayer book, and he grabs me, and I thought, round two. <laughs> and he says, Pastor, you were right. I've been a stupid, stupid man. Now his younger brother, wasn't quite as quick as him, comes running up, and the big one grabs him, does this male thing, you know, pulls him into his chest and does this thing on his hair. He says, this is my brother. It's all over, he said. I love this guy. What happened? We went to the committal service to lower his dad in the grave. You know who wasn't crying anymore? Mom. Why? She got her son back. There was forgiveness. There was redemption. This is the story of the gospel. It's the story of the whole Bible, the overarching story. A lot of little stories in there, some of which are troublesome. But the overall story of the scriptures is God loves every human being, no exceptions. And don't tame Jesus. And don't play small. And this is true in your life. Christian, don't wait you know, 12, 10, 9 years, 3 years, 1 year. You got the Spirit in you. It's a promise. And when Christ makes a promise, he keeps it. Now, we don't always like it. There are some things about Jesus I don't like, and that's one of them. Keep forgiving, Tom. I like to nurse a grudge now and then. I know none of you do, but I do. And I need that Spirit uh, one of our professors at seminary, Jim and I went to the same seminary, used to say, your life is the workshop of the Holy Spirit. All was creating you the life of Christ inside of you. Where does St. Paul put Jesus most of the time? In people, in us, and the Spirit. And that's what's happened to you. Okay, you've got to have one little thing from Martin Luther, or it wouldn't be a Lutheran sermon. All right, Luther, on the Gospels, says this. Now we must confess that God has meted out to us a very full measure. For if God had measured according to our deserts, we would have received nothing but wrath, trouble, misfortune, and earth would have swallowed us up as soon as we were born. To say nothing of the misconduct during our whole life. He's as honest as Peter. The proper measure for us would have been death and hell. But what does God do? God puts aside all we have deserved, wrath, displeasure, judgment, hell and death, and gives us grace, forgiveness, deliverance from the accusations of the law and of our evil conscience. He removes all want and doubt and bestows everything good. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. Live the Christ in you today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.